Yeah, thank you. We're a little behind, so let's move to item four on our agenda, which is the uh, Community Police Commission report. <coughs> and as those presenters come forward to join us at the table, Councilmember Harrell, do you want to introduce this topic? Sure. We have members from the Community Police Commission, the co-chairs, um, Lisa Dugard and Dan Narsaki here, along with the Executive Director, Faye Lopez and Betty Graff from the CPC. We're going to go over their outreach plan. They did a phenomenal job on the outreach process. They will share with you their findings. You should have it on your, your iPads or hard documents. And uh, welcome, and the microphones are yours. And just make sure they're on green and they're very close to your mouth Good there. Good morning. Let's start with Why don't we do introductions, please? Good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank Council President Burgess and Council Member Harrell's office for, for coordinating this opportunity. Okay, and can you pull that a little closer? Yeah, oh, sure. There you go. Uh, and we appreciate the time of the council members this morning. Um, I'm Fed Lopez. I'm the acting director of the Community Police Commission until confirmed later this month, hopefully. Um, Co-chair, we also no have no lobbying here. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also have co-chairs Diane Narasaki and Lisa Dugard and past director Betsy Graff. Uh, I'll quickly, I'll be briefly talk about the CPC uh, as a refresher for the council and for the community members in attendance and who will watch online. I'll then go over our partners in reform, the major stakeholders, uh, and then I'll generally go over the CPC's role, the 2013 recommendations and upcoming work in 2014. Lisa will talk more in depth about the 2013 recommendations. Diane will discuss in detail CPC's outreach into the community and CPC's current work related to accountability. Uh, Lisa will then discuss CPC's work in preventing unnecessary disparities in law enforcement and CPC independence. Then we'll have some time for some, hopefully some questions and answers. Um, <clears throat> In the fall of 2010, the ACLU and 34 other groups asked the U.S. Department of Justice to investigate SPD due to, due to a series of serious incidents involving uh, the community and SPD. After a federal investigation, the City of Seattle signed a settlement agreement with the U.S. Department of Justice to reform SPD practices. As a result of that settlement, a work plan was established. This legal agreement required the creation of the, Se the Seattle Community Police Commission to provide community input on the reform process. The CPC was intended, in the, court, in the words of the court monitor, to be a powerful, independent policy-making body that proceeds carefully based upon evidence and whose conclusions have great integrity and persuasive power. The CPC should consist of 15 members who represent the diversity of Seattle and include people from communities of color, ethnic and faith communities, immigrant communities, the urban Indian community, the LGBT community, civil rights activists, the business community, individuals familiar with the challenges faced by those with mental health and substance issues, and youth. We also have two members who represent both police unions. We are currently short four commissioners at the moment. <laughs> The CPC is, an independ is independent. Its purpose is to engage the community and ensure public input to police reform. Basically, we see our role as engaging all community members and stakeholders in the dialogue on reform. Uh, those partners in reform are the community, us, the City of Seattle, Seattle Police Department, the Federal Court Monitor, and the Department of Justice. In addition to those named, the CPC also works with the City Attorney's Office and multiple technical advisors, um, which most recently includes Dr. Bernard Malekian. <clears throat> Why is the role of the community so important? The community's input and dialogue over time will promote confidence in SPD, strengthen community police relations, and support the police department in ensuring public safety for all. Mm -hmm. CPC core values in engaging the community are partnership driven, meaningful engagement, inclusiveness, and accountability and transparency. The 2013 CPC policy recommendations were bias free policing, stops and detentions, use of force, and in car videos. Mm -hmm. The CPC's work in 2014 includes. Um, work on at the SPD accountability system, preventing unnecessary disparities in law enforcement, SPD training, and an assessment of SPD community outreach. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to Lisa to talk about the 2013 uh, policy recommendations of CPC. 
Thank you very much, Faye. I just want to say that we're also joined by um, Commissioner Jennifer Shaw and former Commissioner Tina Podlodowski, one of the four uh, whom we've lost, who's now senior advisor to Mayor Murray, as you know. Um, so in 2013, we uh, worked on four major policy areas, two of which were uh, commended to the CPC in the Memorandum of Understanding and the Settlement Agreement, and two of which we took on um, after agreement with the Monitor and the other parties because it became clear that it would be helpful for us to do so. One was uh, the new policy on stops and detentions, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it was a great collaborative process, but not one in which there was any major um, uh, policy contribution made by the CPC as distinct from the other entities, we really worked together to um, fine tune that policy to remove some language that was um, extraneous that pertained to arrests. Um, we're proud of the policy and it was really a very um, consensus based approach. Um, the other uh, areas, um, the, the two areas that we added were use of force. Originally, the CPC did not have a defined role in this area, but we unanimously asked to uh, participate in that policymaking process because to us, uh, the origin of this entire process uh, pertained to and centered on use of force. And for the CPC not to have a role in crafting the new policy that became, would become the, you know, one of the foundation blocks for a new approach in this area, um, seemed strange and it also seemed that it would go to uh, really the credibility and legitimacy of the CPC as an institution that was of use to the community. So we asked to participate in that. Ultimately the uh, court agreed that we could um, have some extra time in which to bring to bear community viewpoints. Diana's going to talk about how we marshaled the views of the community as well as the expertise of the CPC to um, inform our recommendations in that area. Ultimately, several of the insights of the CPC working with uh, the um, State Training Academy Director Sue Rar and other technical experts did uh, uh, were brought into the final policy as approved by the Monitor and the Court. We also worked on in-car video, which um, has proven to be a very important tool in accountability. I think we're all aware that video has framed many of the discussions around the critical incidents that uh, brought DOJ to town and subsequently. Um, so we really hosted a multi-party conversation between SPD and, and concerned community members, including the Human Rights Commission. Um, and really, I think at the end of that process, uh, surprised ourselves by the fact that the recommendations that we made were not where many of the participants had started. We had all kind of had the instinct that everything should, or some of us had had the instinct that everything should be recorded. And we ultimately uh, concluded that there was a sweet spot that was not record everything possible that would make uh, in-car video more useful and retrievable um, for accountability and, and training purposes. Um, but finally, I want to emphasize the bias-free policing policy really is the area in which the CPC probably did the most innovative work. Um, we are the only, as a result of the CPC's uh, voluntary partnership with SPD on this, we are now the only, Seattle is the only police department in the country that has chosen to uh, voluntarily, although this is now court ordered because the monitor accepted it and the court ordered it, um, adopt a policy to prevent or reduce disparate, uh, enforcement patterns with disparate impacts. That's something that the city is obliged to do under the regulations implementing Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, but there's no private right of action that allows anybody to sue to enforce those regulations, and they are rarely enforced in a litigation context even by the Justice Department. So for the department to voluntarily step forward and say, you know, we recognize that the core of um, people's concern about bias policing is not acts of individual officers who are badly motivated, but it is really a pattern often of lower level enforcement choices that are not ill-intentioned, but they do have a much greater and heavier impact in certain communities. And where possible, without damaging public safety, we want to try to ameliorate that. So that is the standard that SPD is committed to as a result of this policy. SPD agreed to it after we proposed it. Um, and in this way, I think Seattle is really leading the country in grappling with the heart of contemporary bias in uh, law enforcement. So I'd like to say a word about the uh, community engagement activity of 2013. Um, our reason for being is to ensure uh, a community perspective in police reform. And although the commission itself represents a wide diversity of uh, opinions and of background and experience, 
uh, we want to ensure that uh, the community at large, and particularly communities that have been most affected by um, uh, negative interactions with the police um, are uh, involved in, in police reform. And so to that end, um, in 2013, in October, the uh, commission with over 100 uh, community partners engaged in over 150 uh, outreach meetings and generated over 3,400 um, surveys. Um, and uh, these surveys were translated into nine languages and orally translated into 14 more languages in order to gauge um, the, um, the uh, opinions of uh, the community with respect to uh, whether the police uh, in Seattle uh, are able to police um, fairly and effectively. And um, we learned in that survey um, that uh, an overwhelming majority of the uh, respondents feel that um, there is a problem with um, biased policing in the city and uh, the police um, do use excessive um, use of force. And um, these um, uh, community outreach um, uh, events as well as the surveys enabled us also to uh, gauge the opinions of um, the respondents in terms of whether they felt that uh, certain policy improvements um, could, in fact, uh, improve the situation. And what we heard was um, resounding uh, support for uh, the policy direction that the CPC was considering at the time, which ultimately resulted in the policies that um, Lisa has uh, just explained to you. Um, we will continue to go forward with uh, community engagement uh, throughout our, our process. Uh, and ensure that the voice of the community is heard on major policy initiatives. So in 2014, uh, we have a number of, of areas to cover. Um, the first is um, accountability structure. Uh, the Memorandum of Understanding, which is part of the settlement agreement between the city and the Department of Justice, specifically calls out and charges the uh, Community Police Commission with reviewing the accountability uh, system in Seattle. And uh, to that end, uh, the um, Community Police Commission has been working on reviewing the current community um, um, accountability, or rather the, uh, uh, the SPD accountability system. And um, by March 12th, we hope to have a, a package of recommendations um, that uh, pertain to what we believe any accountability uh, system, any effective accountability system ought to have. Um, by the end of April, uh, we hope to have recommendations on uh, any structural changes um, that we as a commission believe are necessary uh, in order to ensure accountability um, in the city of Seattle. And Related to our accountability recommendations, we have a request to council, and particularly those of you who are on the LRPC, the Labor Relations Policy Committee. Um, many, if not most, of the recommendations likely to come forward from the CPC may or will be mandatory subjects of bargaining with the um, Police Officers Guild. And, um, we are mindful that a public conversation about the um, city's policy priorities here is going to very quickly merge into the city's negotiating agenda with its, um, with its officers uh, and their union. Um, we would ask that the city not be careful not to fully frame or um, reach the end of the conversation about what the city's negotiating agenda is going to be with SPOG before this process of sorry, public input, particularly from the commission, um, is concluded and that we find some way of having, a, uh, basically bringing light into that process. That's always been important. It's a conversation we've all had for over a decade um, and the council has an ordinance requiring a public hearing where the public can come forward. But um, we're gonna, I think, be asking maybe that that proceed even in a different way this year uh, in a way that is possibly more interactive if that is legally permissible. Um, where it's not just that we can share our views, but um, the council and other policymakers may be able to engage in a more interactive dialogue around that. Uh, so it is crucial that this work not, uh, you know, be done now, and then uh, eight months from now we find out that much of it was lost in a negotiating process that happened beyond closed doors, and nobody really knows why. So to the extent possible, we'd like to bring that um, forward into the public, and we'll be discussing that with council staff in the coming uh, month or so. Um, in terms of our work this year on preventing unnecessary disparities in law enforcement, 
the um, policy on bias free policing that I referenced earlier has this provision. It says the policy requires periodic analysis of data which will assist in identification of SPD practices, including stops, citations, and arrests, that may have a disparate impact on particular protected classes relative to the general population. When disparate impacts are identified, the department will consult as appropriate with neighborhood, business, and community groups, including the Community Police Commission, to explore equally effective alternative practices that would result in less disproportionate impact. Alternative enforcement practices may include addressing the targeted behavior in a different way, de-emphasizing the practice in question, or other measures. So essentially, I read that just because that outlines exactly what um, our work plan will be for the rest of the year. In this area, we will be working with SPD to analyze data on, uh, in areas that are highly discretionary and show significant disparities in terms of race, color, and national origin. And um, we will then be engaged in a community-based conversation about um, changes in enforcement practices that would not result in any diminution in public safety or public order, but would result likely in a less disparate impact. So this will be the first, this year will be our first uh, run through th of that process. We're really looking forward to working collaboratively with SPD and with our community partner organizations. I guess the one other, should we jump to independence? Go ahead. Okay. The Can one I other, just say something yes. about the uh, disparate impacts? I think the first step that is absolutely central there is uh, gathering the data. And we know from our experience over the last several years and um, asking for data, it's, it's often not there. Or if it is there, it's not retrievable or whatever. So I know that the council has been very strong in supporting um, the enhancement and the improvement of data collection activities uh, at the police department. That's definitely an ongoing conversation that we're also participating in, but at the CPC we're reality-based and we know that what we have to work with this year will probably not reflect those innovations. So we're consulting with someone who has um, experience working with existing data and a, we have a sampling strategy in mind that should be able to uh, at least do the work that's called for in the area of arrests and citations. Uh, so the one other thing that we wanted to flag that we're likely to be back talking to council about um, is the question of CPC independence. About a year ago when we were first formed, we had an interactive dialogue led by Councilmember Harrell um, in the Public Safety Committee about um, how exactly to uh, structure the CPC to ensure that we are and will remain an independent voice. And uh, at the time, we sort of engaged in a gentle persons agreement between the council, or we were relying on a gentle persons agreement between the council and the mayor's office, which has held, um, which would uh, uh, acknowledge that um, the CPC members give direction to our staff, for example. Um, the CPC then went on to vote unanimously in favor of um, uh, coming back to council uh, in support of an ordinance that would further uh, clarify our independence, but we, but we have supported a number of different options, all the way from something fully structurally independent like the Ethics and Elections Commission to something um, which is still housed in the mayor's office, but where it's clear that the CPC gives programmatic direction to staff. So we will be working with council um, staff again, um, and the law department in coming weeks to further flesh out those models and then we'll be coming back to you and to talk informally about what um, way forward seems most appropriate. We'll obviously be talking with the mayor's office as well. Council Member Sawant. Thank you for presenting this. It's, uh, this is extremely important. I think uh, the uh, extreme disparity in, in the excessive use of force based on race, color, uh, national origin. I think uh, that's been shown. There's no doubt that we should be looking for more sophisticated data analysis, but I think there is absolutely no doubt that there is happening, and it was indicated by your survey as well. Uh, what, what kind of actual jurisdiction does the CPC have over the police department? Uh, what, how, what's the process by which they're required to take your recommendations? What is the process by which they will be evaluated on whether those changes have happened? I mean, I, I would worry that this should not just be yet another, just a rubber stamping of you know, guidelines, but they don't actually get implemented. And we need urgent change to respond to the 
some of the real acts of brutality that have happened in this city, and it, it, we, we, you know, we have to address this. <coughs> Well, in terms of our jurisdiction and authority, we primarily have moral authority. We um, and um, that ebbs and flows in its power. <laughs> it's, um, not it's not enforceable. We well, I, I say that, but I don't mean to minimize it. Actually, the composition of the commission does and is meant to um, draw on. Uh, connections to all segments of the community, and we really do view our authority as coming from the community. So that's why we've emphasized the community outreach process and the report, the need for us to report back periodically to our community partners. Um, if the recommendations that we labor on in conjunction with SPD don't find any traction, then that's a conversation that we would need to have with, uh, with you all and with our community partners. We're really optimistic that that's um, not the situation that we, find, that we will find ourselves in. There is a real spirit of partnership and cooperation, especially in this area. Um, I think it's because this policy has been framed as a win-win opportunity. The language that I read you, which is pathbreaking nationally, was authored by Kate Jonkis, one of the commission members who's the head of the Downtown Seattle Association. And I think this is very important. It represents that um, there's a vision on the commission that uh, the interests of neighborhoods and businesses can be served um, with changed enforcement patterns that have a less disparate impact than we've seen in the past. And so there's an intentionality about reframing our um, direction in policing um, that I think has a lot of power in the community and will find a receptive audience as we try to communicate about it. So if we do encounter difficulty, we'll definitely be back uh, to, to tell you about it, but we're hopeful. I also think it's important to remember that um, the uh, Community Police Commission uh, was created by the Memorandum of Understanding, which is part of the, the settlement agreement. And um, it is the only one of its kind in the country. And the fact that um, the city of Seattle is court ordered um, to make reforms and um, to make timely reforms, and uh, the fact that there are many uh, entities involved uh, beyond ourselves, of course, um, the um, beyond SPD, there is also um, the Department of Justice, um, there is uh, the city attorney's office, uh, there's the council, there's the mayor. Um, there uh, are um, any uh, number of entities that are closely watching uh, and uh, participating in uh, reform at this stage. Um, the extent to which uh, the Community Police Commission's um, uh, power, uh, if you will, uh, will uh, be uh, effective is the extent to which any of the, the entities um, uh, take up uh, the recommendations of the CPC um, in um, uh, different formats and, and opportunities. So for instance, uh, we hope to come forward, as I said, uh, after uh, March 12th with recommendations on what we believe any effective accountability system should have. Um, we hope that those recommendations will be seriously considered by, um, by the city uh, as uh, they enter into uh, discussions and negotiations with um, SPD. Um, we are uh, grateful to not only have a range of uh, civil rights and civil liberties activists, um, business and, and faith leaders, um, and uh, providers of treatment services for people with mental illness and people with substance use disorder, um, and also uh, members of the LGBT community, immigrants and refugees. Um, but we also have members of both um, police unions on the uh, CPC. And uh, we have found um, their insights uh, extremely helpful as we review um, these recommendations and form them. We have formed these together. Uh, so we believe that um, because of the unique crossroads that the CPC is um, and where it sits in the reform um, uh, process, uh, we have the ability um, to uh, come up with uh, insights and recommendations which can then be taken up by the, the relevant bodies. Thank you. And I think you made a very important point, which is that the extent to which the CPC's recommendations will be implemented will depend on how much the city elected officials respond to these issues. And I think that's absolutely uh, important for us to remember that the community should hold the elected officials accountable for progress on this. And I look forward to reviewing this with you. Thank you. Thank I have a question. Are we, uh, we're going a little short on time. Are you finished with your formal report? And this is Q&A, or did we 
interrupt you. Uh, this is the okay. formal report. I, I just uh, like to mention in closing that um, we did produce a report as a result of the um, community um, outreach, um, and I believe all the council members received it. Um, but it is going to be available uh, for anyone who, who would be interested in the results. So here's the. We've brought hard copies yeah, of that here's report, the report with for you. anyone who is Council interested. Members, the link yeah. is in the iPads. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's very well done. Thank you. Thank you. I had a question on one of the points you made about uh, at some point a recommendation toward uh, striving for more independence. Uh, the current structure that you have with 15 members, um, staff, uh, that we've tried to provide you and some resources, is there something in the current structure now that is inhibiting? what you would want in terms of your independence, or are you just looking at a model that you think may make sense? I'm trying to see what problem we're trying to solve with the need for mm -hmm. more independence, I should say. I, I think the problem was evident when uh, we were discussing in the Public Safety Committee a year ago the fact that the, ordinan the current CPC ordinance is really silent on who gives direction to our staff. And that is a situation that um, was recognized again a year ago unanimously by CPC members as needing a solution. There just there needs to be a rule of decision about who directs staff and formally. Uh, Couldn't one uh, argue that you're not prohibited from directing the staff then? It's just that if we direct the staff and the mayor's office directs the staff, who who do the staff follow? It's a, that's a Has tough call a for problem? any employee. Has there been mixed directions? I would like directions? to just clarify that this is a structural question, um, not a, a personal or, or political question. Um, from the very uh, beginning meetings of the CPC, we looked at um, this question because uh, it is not inconceivable uh, that a difference can arise between the uh, Community Police Commission and the Mayor's Office. And when, uh, if and when um, that uh, kind of disagreement arises, to whom does the staff um, respond? Uh, the staff is hired by the, uh, the mayor. Uh, the staff is uh, confirmed by the, the council. Um, uh, but the that. staff is to, to serve uh, the Community Police Commission. Um, so. Uh, the staff, in effect, has several masters, and we seek to, to clarify um, that structure. So, I, and I didn't mean to cut short, at least I'm, I was short of time, so that's yep, what I'm trying totally. to cut to the chase, because what I'm trying to understand is uh, I, I welcome any thoughts you have toward independence, but what I better welcome is a problem I'm trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm asking in the last year. I'm, I'm very confident we have a supportive Tina, a supportive executive director, and very strong leaders in the CPC. And I'm not, I haven't heard of any conflicts because I'm quick to identify them, have a transparent conversation about it. And so the absence of direction, it would seem to me that you have, you have complete authority to give direction. And to the extent the public safety chair or the executive or anyone else are giving competing uh, directions, then we have a problem we need to fix. But uh, you have so much work to do. I mean, you're doing a lot of policy work. You're looking at the OPA and the OPARP structure. I was just trying to see where that issue fit into the big scheme of things because I haven't heard of mixed signals to uh, from you know the, the conflict yet. That, that's what I was trying to drive. Just so to directly answer your question, no, to my knowledge, and we're not asking staff, I guess, to answer this because that. <laughs> uh, but to my knowledge, no, we haven't uh, experienced that uh, issue to to this point. But we're it it would be easy to anticipate that that could happen even with the best of intentions from all uh, from all sides. And so we want to, in, uh, at some point, align the ordinance with the practice that we've all settled on, even if that is only the de facto current reality, which is that the uh, commission gives programmatic direction to staff, then mm -hmm. it would be wonderful to align the ordinance with that, uh, sure. what, what's worked well for us so far. Council Member O'Brien. I, I appreciate this conversation. I, my, my sense is that things have worked very well to date, but I also could anticipate a point in time where there would be some tension there. And at that point, if we were to take action um, over who directs and who hires or how that works out, it could be very um, tricky to get into. And so it would be nice to resolve this while everyone's getting along. Um, exactly. And hopefully it, <laughs> hopefully it never becomes an issue, but I do think it, it, it might be prudent to address this um, in the, well, well, conditions are good. Councilmember Clark. Sorry. So uh, I, I am particularly interested in the idea that you will have some set of recommendations before parameters are set for the next uh, set of negotiations, particularly with the Guild. Uh, and I was kind of playing through what you were talking about in terms of, you know, is that presented during 
uh, I imagine it's, it's a, a uh, well-crafted letter of some kind. <laughs> and we do have the requirement that there is the public hearing before the city um, sets itself on course uh, to, to begin negotiations with SPOG. And it is a little tricky to think about what does that look like in terms of a work session, because I'm not sure how you do that in, uh, and you guys have, have clearly thought this out, I don't know how you do that in public session uh, in beyond really just sort of receiving it and asking questions, a work session so does seem a little bit more difficult. So I don't know if you've thought about that. I think I'm, I'm looking forward to what that list looks like. And there have been a lot of conversations over the past year about you know, what are we really negotiating over? Are we going to really bargain over accountability things? Is it really just figuring out how we implement them in the best way possible? Mm -hmm. And I'll be interested in what that what that looks like in the recommendations from the from the CPC. I think as part of our recommendations package, we will also be considering what we're really asking for mm -hmm. um, in terms of a process for discussing those recommendations. And again, with staff and with the city attorney's office. And I, I, if I could just take a moment to acknowledge how grateful we are for the technical assistance we've received from city council staff, from the city attorney's office, um, all of the other partners um, whom Diane uh, mentioned during our presentation, and particularly for Faye and for Betsy. Uh, Betsy is here with us today. <coughs> Um, won't be with the um, the office indefinitely, and this might be our last chance to publicly acknowledge that we would not have survived last year without Betsy Graff, and we're incredibly grateful to her and really delighted to have Faye. So with that, should I try to wrap up? And I wanted to thank Betsy, too, for an outstanding job and, and, and the work that all of you are doing. And the reason why I was a little... Um, aggressive in the conversation about independence is, is I know in my conversations with the executive and my colleagues on the council, we've, we've intentionally tried to give you as many resources and autonomy as possible. So when I hear about you want more independence, I'm trying to think, well, what else can we do? But I, I welcome the recommendations and the discussion. This document you prepared was, bar none, just, just um, a great document, very comprehensive, very thoughtful, and you, um, the public outreach piece was just, like I said, just phenomenal. So I want to thank you for your strong leadership and look forward to being a continuing partner uh, from the council standpoint. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank City council ordinance members. does require a public hearing uh, by the council's public safety committee and labor relations committee along with the OPA review board before the city finalizes bargaining parameters and we're in the process now of working with council member Harrell's schedules um, to get that scheduled either in late March or early April. We still have time to do that, but don't take long in <laughs> getting your recommendations. I mean, the sooner we can receive those, the better. Thank you. Great. Duly noted. And <laughs> Thank you very much.